Welcome to the Nonprofit Report, your weekly update on nonprofit organizations, issues, and leaders. I'm your host, Mark Oppenheim. Today, we will be going behind the scenes at a food bank to talk about the logistics of supplying food to people with special guests. Mark Skernick, the Second Harvest Food Bank of our county senior sourcing manager. Randy Akahoshi, a sales and procurement development specialist with one of their key donor vendors, Maui Fresh International. And Jerry Creekbaum, Chief Operations Officer of Second Harvest Food Bank of Orange County. So thank you all for joining. It's just wonderful to have you here and to be talking about this, this really important issue. We, we all saw the really heart-wrenching uh, pictures of people lining up for food. And whenever there is a disaster, as, as I mentioned in Louisiana in the run-up to the show, um, you have this real uptick. So I'm so very grateful that you can all give us some insight. And just to set, set you up, I'm going to go to you, Mark, uh, first. In Orange County alone, there are over 400 people who are food insecure and especially impacted are children, seniors living on fixed incomes, veterans, people with disabilities, those without homes, and so on. So we have a huge cohort of people who have real need, and, and it's a day-to-day -day need. You are a survival tool. So let's talk about how you actually find food so that people can eat tonight. Mark, talk a little bit about how you, you do your job of, of finding that nourishment for, for uh, your neighbors. I have a contact list that I've built up over the last five decades in the food business, mostly in the produce industry. Randy is one of those contacts. Um, I reach out to them with a, an email blast every Monday morning, uh, followed up by uh, personal emails, texts, phone calls, and the like. Um, and I get, I get a, a very good number of responses for merchandise that's, that is being made available to us. Uh, to access that merchandise, some of the companies and some of the contacts delivered to us, Randy's company is one of those. Uh, with others, we will contract with uh, freight companies if it's a distance issue. And we have a, a pretty good sized fleet of our own. And using our transportation department, they make it happen for us. And they're able to pick up the merchandise and get it to our food bank uh, in a timely manner. And that's pretty much how it works. And you've, you've had five decades in this field, right? So you've been on the business side, and now you're on the nonprofit side. Could you just sort of uh, outline for us um, your, your various career segments? Because those, that, that expertise that you've accumulated, which you are now placing at the disposal of a civil society purpose, is so critical to the success of the food bank, to what somebody experiences when they when they start to pick up carrots or fresh fruit, um, you know, at 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 the outlet. Um, I grew up in a grocery store, and uh, um, my professional life, you know, started when I was eighteen. Newly arrived here in California, and continued in, in a grocery store and a supermarket of my own. Uh, two other markets followed that. And uh, working for some of the chain stores in Southern California, gravitating from clerk to produce manager to produce supervisor to produce buyer, and then to the wholesale side, uh, starting in uh, purveying, uh, working for a purveyor, I should say, um, and then getting a job on the market in L.A., where I worked with Randy's dad. That's how I first met Randy. I oh, really? So it's so it's a family affair. That's that's really great. It is. I I met his, well. I know his dad before, but we 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 worked as together at Marino Brothers uh, on the LA market, starting in 1988. So I've known Randy since he was a little kid, uh, actually as a teenager. <laughs> and um, I, I really, I, I really enjoyed produce more than the grocery end of the business, and that's why I ended up you know, in the wholesale end. And I've worked on the market, I worked on and off the market for about thirty-three, maybe, maybe thirty-five years um, 
in one capacity or another. Um, I started going to the market, wholesale market, in 1972. That's when it was the just the L.A. market and the 9th Street market. 9th Street market is where Randy's father uh, was. And then in the mid-'80s, that market started to move to the new L.A. market, which is no longer new. It's, it's, it's closing in on, on close to 40 years old. Um, and... That's where uh, most of my contacts uh, started to develop. It, was, it oh. started a little, started a little bit in the early '70s, but mostly when I was actually working on the market, uh, either as a buyer or as a salesman or as a general manager. So, Randy, when you get a uh, call from somebody you've known for such a long time and trusted for such a long time, how does how does this this work? How do you? Uh, how do you, because you, you've known Mark for such a long time. When Mark says something, you know, you, you have the context. He understands your language. Um, talk a little bit about your business first, the shape of your business, because you are a commercial enterprise, right? Correct. So, um, so talk about the shape of your <laughs> business and, and how you got involved in the food bank business. Well, in produce, we've always been involved in one shape or form in food banks and donating uh, to different charities, different food banks and whatnot. Uh, like Mark said, I've known him most of my life. My career started when I was probably nine years old, uh, going to family farms, working on farms, working at markets and gravitated to uh, being in uh, the produce business because uh, there's no business like this. And like Mark said, it is a family business. It's for we may be work for different companies, but we do consider ourselves as family and we do trust each other. Um, and we go by a general rule of thumb. A handshake is as good as anything. And we take our word for it. You know, not, nowadays we have to sign everything and our life away. And uh, if anything goes wrong, uh, we're doomed. But our trust is our, is our credibility. So, so when you get a call from from Mark um, and, uh, about a particular need, or you have a particular supply, and you're reaching out to Mark, mm -hmm. how does that that go from there? So that you end up with pallets um, in in Jerry's warehouse um, that can then be distributed out. Uh, what happens is I put together a list on the previous Thursday or Friday and send it over to Mark for what we think was going to be available from our growers, suppliers, uh, who have overabundance of product for the following week, whether it be Monday, Tuesday, Wednesday, whatever it may be. And it could be run a gamut from uh, greens, wet greens, uh, conventionally or organic. It can be anywhere from uh, different types of melons, uh, bell peppers, squashes. Uh, here at Maui, we, we, we have a whole array of uh, fruits and vegetables that we sell. And some, sometimes we have overabundance. Uh, our growers will have stuff and they would say, you know, just take it. And, you know, there's only so much demand for some of the stuff. And then and before it goes, oh, uh, goes bad, uh, I get Mark and say, hey, I got bell peppers. I got six pellets of bell peppers, 12 pellets of zucchini. I got this and that. And then he would make the decision of what he wants. Because he has, like you said, he has other suppliers. And plus, USDA is part of their program, too. And so, you're helping the growers because the growers, once they've grown something, they have, to, they have to get that out of the field. Correct. Right? And they have to get it onto pallets. Now they have a transportation cost. Mm -hmm. so, you, so what you're trying to do is you're trying to ameliorate the negative impact of having oversupply, which can't necessarily be perfectly predicted on the growers. Meanwhile, you have an oversupply now because right. you're trying to support that extended family of growers who are connected to you, mm -hmm. right? So Mark is reaching out to you and, and, and basically saying, hey, we can we have a need here. Let's let's cooperate together and get that need fulfilled. That is correct. And like there will be times where I won't have anything for him, whether uh, it's because of quality or whether it's because of um, items they already have in the warehouse. But uh, it's, like I said, it's a partnership. And 
we're happy to be part of the second harvest and help and help feed uh, the families in Orange County. Uh, we hope to. I mean, we're involved with other food food banks within the within the LA area, but we see such a need, and that you know, one of the biggest things that we see though is that because of labor issues, a lot of these growers are leaving a lot of product in the field they can't pick. They have to let it go. So that that's a big, that's another big issue that's that's happening here uh, within the produce industry, and we're all trying to find out what we can do, but, you know, the growers men tell you as well, I'm not going to grow as much, but, you know, the supply and demand. But the need is still, the need is still there. You yes. know, um, Jerry, when it, when it gets to you where you're orchestrating, first of all, you have to find people of Mark's deep knowledge and networks to bring into the organization. You have to have, be connected to people like Randy. And this is, sort of a microcosm of a part of your operation. How do you knit this together? Because this is a very complicated calculus. As Randy said, it changes season to season, uh, perhaps week to week. Um, how are you doing this? Do you have like massive computers and sort of figuring it all out for you? Or do you actually rely on human beings? Uh, computers are definitely used, but it is the human beings that are making uh, it all happened. You know, in this conversation, we've been talking about relationships. Uh, the answer to the question you just asked me is very similar. Relationships on both sides of the um, the, the food bound, inbound streams and, and balancing that. Uh, Mark being a member of our organization was extremely intentional as we were looking to improve the nutritious quality of the food that we were being able to distribute. Uh, we sought out a, a professional who understood produce better than we do ourselves. And that's how we met Mark. And we're you know, extremely excited that he's on board with us. The connectivity, of course, adds to that. So it is an intentional uh, effort of the organization to bring in more produce, more fresh and much more nutritious product for the families that we're serving. Now, in, in terms of the connection between supply and demand, um, you know, th this is a really worrying element. There's a huge, huge demand uh, that people have uh, for um, affordable, fresh, nutritious product. And particularly people at the lower level of income, maybe one week they can afford and the next week they can't, right? So going into retail outlets on a regular basis is not necessarily doable. Meanwhile, as Randy pointed out, we have some issues with labor um, where, where food is left in the field. Um, how do we deal with this um, on a sustained basis? Because it looks like our need is outstripping our ability to supply, Jerry. Um, how do we, how do we uh, make this an optimal uh, situation where everybody can make their contribution, people can get fed. Is this really something that has to be done on a voluntary basis? Does this need to be organized in, in a different way across different organizations, across uh, growers and suppliers and so on in a, in a better way? How do you see it? Well, I think you're touching on it well. It is, um, you know, it's my personal belief that there's enough food in this country to, that there should not be a hunger problem anywhere in the country. It is, a, it is much more about the logistics and, and the awareness and the knowledge of what can be done and getting those collaborations, much like we're describing here today, where you have the supply side uh, connecting to a, call it a portal. So our, our food bank acts as a, uh, a capable agency that works with frontline uh, hunger relief nonprofits that are doing the, you know, doing the magic work of actually getting the food to the people uh, right out there on the front line. They are typically smaller. They have less resources. They are very volunteer driven and being able to partner with them and supply the food that they need to uh, help attack the hunger issue. It is really about logistics. I mean, the more that we're able to build these collaborations and then emulate that which works and learn from what did not work and just continue to keep refining it and refining it. So your point is that the issue is not our ability to grow. 
All right. The issue is really the ability to get the food from where it is to where it is needed. And that includes the issue with labor that Randy pointed out, the issue with getting it from the uh, place where it's grown uh, out to uh, to Randy's facility. And then the issue of getting it to your facility and then beyond that from your facility into the homes of individuals where they live. It's really a transportation, logistics and coordination problem. As well as uh, the one very key factor is cold chain. Uh, we're dealing with perishable products a lot more than ever in food banking across the country for the, you know, for very positive reasons. That adds, uh, it is more costly. It is um, more speed and efficiency are of the utmost. You need to get it as soon as you can, as fresh as you can, keep it that way throughout the entire receipt to distribution purpose, or sorry, process. And so it adds some complications, but it, it is definitely something that can be done. It is being done and we just can, needs to continue. Um, we did get a question about what happens with spoiled food um, that actually um, at, at, at the end of the day, you might have some spoilage there. Uh, do you compost it? Do you, um, do you just throw it away? What, what happens there, Jerry? No, our organization works and is working towards becoming zero waste. Uh, all of our organic waste is is picked up by our hauler and then goes to anaerobic digestion. So it is, you know, I don't understand the process fully, but it basically just uh, rather than going to landfill, it gets uh, digested much like our stomachs do. And a byproduct of digestion is an energy supply source. Oh, that's that's so you're focused on sustainability as well as, uh, as food sustainability, but also in other ways as well. Uh, we are as, as well. Uh, we do have zero tolerance, also zero waste also. So if something is spoiled, we have a, a company that comes by, picks it up. Uh, sometimes they will make it into feed, but just like old Jerry says, they do into a bio, a biosphere type of thing where it's, it's put back into the land. Now, one of the things that we just asked in a, in a poll, it's an interesting response. We said if, if families earning an average income are food insecure, which which they are, right? It's average income, they're food insecure. But think about that for a second, average, right? Think about all the people who are earning less than the average. It's half of the people are learning, but just definitionally are learning less than that average income. Does the government have a responsibility to implement policy tax or legal fixes? So we just asked that as an open-ended question. 92% of those people listening said uh, yes, and, and, um, and, and a, a small proportion said no. Um, Mark, when you look at this as an overarching problem, as sort of as an American citizen who really understands the supply uh, elements here, um, is this something that, um, that can be solved um, on an, a sort of an America-wide basis, or is this something that uh, really needs to be addressed on a, on a regional basis as you're doing uh, in Orange County through the food bank? I believe that the government does have a role in this. Um, however, it's, it's, it's be- we are better suited uh, than any governmental agency to a- address the problems locally. So if we, if we can get their assistance, that's great. Um, but whether we get their assistance or not, locally, regionally, we, we can do the job, and we have been doing the job, and we're going to continue to do the job. Well, that's, it, it's interesting because it actually ties into what you're all saying in terms of understanding what's going on uh, on the ground. Um, uh, Jerry, could you just comment a little bit about uh, what happens after the food comes into your facilities? and how it gets distributed out, because there are a number of different mechanisms, including people driving up in their cars, um, but there are a number of different mechanisms to get food to where it is needed. How does that function? We utilize, as Mark mentioned earlier, we have our fleet of trucks. Now, as for people driving up in their cars, that's not how the food bank works. Again, we work with the frontline nonprofit agencies that are out there, and we direct questions and inquiries about how can I get food to those partner networks nearest where the, the call or the request is coming from uh, using zip codes and how can we direct them. So again, keeping it as efficient as possible. 
Uh, we have a push model, and so that we are working with our, our partners, and they report the number of people that are, that they are serving, and that is a, a repeated, recurring. Every month, we get an update from them on how many people are coming to them and needing the assistance. And then we take everything that's in the inventory and that they have the capacity to distribute and we push it out to them. So that can either be delivered on our vehicles or if a partner has uh, some capability of their own to transport it, they, we ha have a pickup portion of that as well. In addition, we have our targeted programs specifically targeting children and seniors in ways in, in that ship we will be partnering with schools, or senior centers or uh, senior living communities in getting food directly to them. We're still working with a partner when we do so, but it is much more of our, our involvement directly in those types of aspects. So one of the things that I find so interesting is that this is kind of a, a mirror image of what Randy experiences, right? You're getting a list from your partners, your trusted partners who you have also been doing work with for a long period of time. You're hearing about their needs. You have a supply. It's very similar, right, to what to what Randy experiences. And that that issue of trust, just as Randy said, his his trust that he's built over the years with Mark, your trust that you built over the years with with those people who are the front line distrib uh, distribution force uh, is so important. Yes, and I would say it's definitely trust, but it's also verified. We have a responsibility of feeding people not uh, in, and ensuring the safety of the food. Uh, as you know, I see Randy nodding. He's absolutely on board with that. Part of our commitment to our donors is that we're going to ensure that the food is distributed safely. So there are interactions uh, and monitoring with the partner network on a regular basis um, just to, to ensure that they are following the same steps that we all are in order to keep that food safe. Now, Randy, um, in terms of, of anything that has to do with fresh food, right, there is a certain amount of spoilage and there's a certain amount of liability. I'm sure that the Food Bank is not the only philanthropic organization that, that you're, you're working with. How does that function from a business point of view? Because one of the, one of the uh, big impediments to making contributions that businesses sometimes experience is a worry that, that um, their good deed will end up being punished. Uh, somewhere down the road. Are, are you at all concerned about those kinds of factors? And, and how do you interact with your philanthropic partners uh, on those issues? Like for us on our side, uh, not that we can be 100% sure that everything is of quality. I mean, things will go through because it's fresh produce. Uh, but we try here, we QC it before it goes out to uh uh, to Mark's place or to other entities within the city, uh, different food banks and whatnot. Uh, if it's if it isn't any, it, we like I said, we go through. We call our dump, or well, I'm going to say dump, but our spoilage company to come pick it up, and they do what they have to do. Uh, a lot of our grower partners understand our process. Uh, they are happy that we do it, and you know they're in. Going back to what Jerry was talking about and when we were talking about labor, uh, one company uh, in the Midwest did something on their farm. They didn't have enough workers. And a lot of produce was going, going bad. They had a farm day. They opened it up to anybody who wanted to come in, pick what you wanted, take it home. And within three days, the, that one particular parcel, where I think it was eight acres, was clean and nothing was lost. So that's, that's, that's so things, uh, what, what some of these innovative farmers are doing. Instead of letting it go, they're letting, it's all usable product. They just got to go out there and just cut it. I mean, and it's a little experience too. This is how asparagus is grown. This is how cabbage is grown. This is how lettuce is grown. So it's a teaching moment also. So uh, like Jerry was saying that he goes into schools and, and uh, senior care facilities. I'm very proponent of the fresh produce, fresh produce into schools and teaching them about nutrition, teaching about. But the biggest thing I, th I get a kick out of when I talk to them about it is how things are grown because they just see it at the store or they see it in a can or they see it in a box. They don't know how it gets there. Well, so especially, think, the, especially the little kids who have never seen like, um, a, you know, a, a, a bean grow or pea oh yeah. or, oh yeah. you know. I mean, the excitement on their faces is, is just like, Wow. 
know, to you and I, it's well, yes, something going on, but to them, it's wonder. It's like I want to know more about that. So I commend Jerry and his group and reaching out to the kids and to the schools to get them to eat healthy. In in many respects, what we're talking about is the origin of what. Uh, the American theory, the economic theory is, mm-hmm. right? It's it's not just figuring out how to extract as much as we can for me, mm-hmm. right? It's it's really about the interactions and giving, right, through our economic activity, um, benefiting somebody else, right? Educating somebody else, communing with somebody else. It's really the social compact, right? And and what what you are all reflecting is, is a manifestation of the social compact, which was really at the founding uh, of the United States. In terms of, of uh, how you see the, uh, the issue developing into the future, um, how do you see this business uh, developing, Mark? You've, you've had a very, very long experience um, in this field. You've seen a lot of changes. You've seen uh, the advent of computerization and and different techniques, um, but in in many respects, so much is is the same, right? It's still about trust. It's still about logistics. You still have to physically move a product from one place to another. You have to think about time when you're thinking about fresh. Uh, do you see going into the future that there will be uh, other challenges or uh, particular issues that might be affecting your supply of food over the next years? Well, here in California, water, that's, that's, it's, it's been an issue. It is an issue. It will continue to be an issue due to climate change. So that, that will be, in my opinion, that would be the major factor because at one time or it doesn't matter what day of the year it is, there's something growing and being harvested here in California. Uh, granted, you know, we're in Southern California. Uh, we have access to apples and pears and tree fruit from Washington, same thing from Oregon, crops from all over California, onions and potatoes from Nevada, um, row crops too from Arizona. Um, there's the, uh, oh, there's Otay Mesa uh, along the border in uh, near San Diego, which is a port of entry. But all along the West, it's still the water issue, right? It, it, it is, but we have, we're, we're lucky that we're here and we still have access to all these different areas that we can uh, access product from. Nogales, Arizona, Yuma, Arizona. We're fortunate geographically because of that. Yes, water, to me, is my opinion, is going to be the, the biggest factor. But it's incumbent upon me and, and my staff to still find the sources of merchandise uh, and pounce on it whenever, whenever it's made available to us. That is, that is our job. That's our goal. And that's what we do every day. Something I learned um, and was actually um, repeated to me by Randy's father so many years ago. And that was uh, something that I learned when I was first going to the, L- the markets in LA in 1972. No two days are alike in the produce business. Every day is different. So when we wake up in the morning, I see Randy nodding, nodding in agreement. When we wake up every morning or every night, uh, and we're we're about to go to to do our job and, and accept the challenges of the day. It's not like yesterday, last week, last month, last year, or whatever. Brand new day, similar but brand new challenges, and we get to work. Uh, changes the spice of life, right? Um, we just completed a poll and we asked, uh, do you help or donate to food banks? And we had um, uh, eight, uh, almost 80% of the people said uh, that, that they did. And we had a previous poll uh, which asked, um, had, did they think that food banks were, were very important, uh, somewhat essential, uh, that they were neutral? Uh, uh, basically, two-thirds of the people said that uh, were, were either absolutely essential or somewhat essential uh, to to our economy. Uh, Randy, same question to you in terms of how do you see the future? You're, you're working on the commercial space. You're working in the philanthropic space. You're working with your growers. What do you see the, the future as, as bringing in terms of opportunities and also challenges? Well, I agree with Marco. It's about the water. Uh, that is going to be the major issue here in Southern California. Uh, but as far as sourcing product, we source globally 
we source out of Canada, we source out of Europe, we source out of Mexico. Uh, so the, the amount of product that is available to us is still there. It's just that logistically we yeah. have to get it here. And no, 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 right. because of all the different food safety uh, requirements that we have to go through and all the different uh, paperwork we have to go through, we are very diligent on who we deal with. So on our supply side, we have this trust factor with our grower partners that they are going to send us the product that we will need to supply not only the retails and the food service business that we do here all in Southern California and across the country, but also have access to product that we can donate to the food banks to ensure that they have the right product. And uh, um, Jerry, Randy set you up well with the logistics challenges, right? I mean, you know, at the end of the day, even if you're sourcing internationally, to the extent that you cannot grow uh, locally, you end up having to truck things in, um, you know, move by rail or ship or whatever, which, you know, we have this greenhouse gas uh, issue and climate change. Um, There's no easy answer, is there? Well, that's that's perfectly stated. There are no easy answers, but there are efforts. And one of the efforts that we are have done in the past and are doing now on a much larger scale um, is farming ourselves with part with the local farmer and uh, the Skrek Center, which is at one of the, part of the UC campus. So yesterday morning, we planted the first acre of 45 acres that we will be growing product within a quarter mile of our distribution center. So uh, first harvest of that expected in November, uh, virtually eliminating all of those challenges that you just listed um, or, or close to all of them by doing it local, doing it very close and in partnership and in collaboration with those who really know what they're doing. So we're not, food bankers aren't trying to be farmers, but instead working with a uh, third generation farmer, A.G. Kawamura, uh, on that. And then other things are going to be just continuous improvement. Can we do it better? Can we find ways to do it uh, faster, safer, more efficiently and learning from others? So always being open minded to learning something from someone else. You can't think of it all ourselves. What a great, great uh, statement to end on this the whole idea of relationships, of respecting the knowledge of different people, of of being informed by generations. A.G. Um, uh, talked with me about uh, how many generations his family has been in, in, um, in farming and in urban farming uh, as well. It's, it's, it's so important, the human element, right? the human element, the ability to invest as a business in philanthropic activities and invest in careers in, in, a, uh, in a focus on strengthening civil society through your work at food banks. Thank you so much for joining us, Mark Skernick, the Food Bank's Senior Sourcing Manager, uh, Randy Akahoshi, Sales and Procurement Development Specialist for Maui Fresh International, and Jerry Creekpalm, Chief Operations Officer, Second Harvest Food Bank of Orange County. Thank you so much for sharing your work with us. Thank your staffs. Thank your donors. Thank your communities, your volunteers. It is just wonderful to be informed by your experience. Have a great day. Thank you.